Thank you. you. May be seated. Well, you'll be going to the book of 1 Peter today, 1 Peter, and we're going to be going uh, back and forth to different parts of 1 Peter, and I want to give you a little bit of a warning this morning because a tradition that we always have, or not a tradition, but something I always provide are PowerPoint slides for you to fill in those blanks. Today we have no PowerPoint slides. That is not because of anybody's fault. It's because I made a decision because today... Here's what I want you to do. Are you with me? Say amen. Amen. I want you to listen. Amen. Amen. And I also want you to be flipping. I want you to flip in your Bible to where we're going to be going today. And it's mainly going to be just in 1 Peter. Don't worry about some of the other passages we'll be reading this morning. I'll just read them to you and you soak them in. But, you know, in our society, we've become poor listeners, haven't we? We just don't listen very well. We are already ready to give an answer to somebody we're speaking with. We already have something we're thinking about, and most of the time we're not even listening to what other people are saying. So today we're going to practice listening and flipping, all right? We're going to flip through the Word of God and see what He has to say to us. So that's just up front. want to make sure you know that that screen back there is not going to move from that first slide. Well... Today we are a divided nation, but we need not be a divided church. Amen? Amen. Last week we were reminded of who Christ is. We said that Christ is supreme. We said that Christ is sovereign. And we said that Christ is Savior. We are to trust in Him and in Him alone. And knowing who Christ is, that he is in fact supreme, that he is in fact sovereign, and that he is in fact Savior brings the Christian peace. We remind ourselves of who we are in Christ, and this brings us purpose. The last several weeks and even months, we've been looking at who Christ is and also who we are in Christ. In the book of 1 Peter, and we're going to continue to do that today. I want to take this opportunity this morning to just simply remind ourselves of who we are in Christ. Sinclair Ferguson said, much of pastoral ministry is simply reminding your people who they are in Christ again and again. And so we'll do that this morning. Why would I choose this topic? After a contentious election, after uncertainty even now, after everything that's going on in our country It's important for us as believers to understand, first, who Christ is. But then, secondly, who we are in Christ. And so, before we get into the scriptures this morning, let's ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. Father, we do come before you and ask that you would take your word and that you would do what only you can do with it. That you would implant it in our hearts and in our minds and that you would change us more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would be with my lips, that you would be with my words, that you would be with my actions, and that also, Lord, that you would be with the hearts and the ears of those who are here, those who are listening to this message, that you would just simply take your spirit and impress upon them what they need to hear this morning from you. God, I pray that we would walk out of this church emboldened to serve you, that we would walk out of this church ready to worship you, that we would walk out of this church with Hope renewed in our hearts and our eyes solely focused on King Jesus. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen. Who we are in Christ. Number one, we are saved. We are saved. As believers, we often don't think about this enough, but we need to think about it daily. That we are in fact saved. Now saved is one of those words, it's a Christianese word, right? It's this word that we know as Christians what it means, but the world doesn't really know what it means. And a lot of Christians or so-called Christians don't even really know what it means. 1 Peter chapter 1. I want you to look at verses 3 through 5. Peter says in verse number 3 of chapter 1, if you're with me, say amen. amen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance 
which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Now verse 5. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I want you to just look over a few verses into verse number 9 and 10 of chapter 1. Peter says, Obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls, and as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries. Now what we need to understand this morning is that we are saved. This will bring comfort to our hearts in times of difficulty and trial. No matter what you're going through in life, rest on the sure foundation that you are saved. John 3.36 says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. See, we have to understand and remember what we're saved from. We talked about this last week. We talked about the gospel. This, This is the most important thing in church. This is the most important thing in your life. And it would behoove us as believers to be reminded of this daily. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. You say, Dave, why do you talk about the gospel so much? Because I don't want somebody in here to sit here week after week, month after month, year after year. And at the end of their life, when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ, not have heard the gospel. What is the gospel? Can you articulate the gospel to someone? Because right now in our day and age, we are a country that needs to hear the gospel. Some of you are looking for hope and you're looking for answers in the wrong places and you have the answer right in your hands. You have the answer right in your heart. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? It is the fact that God is just and righteous and holy and we are not. It is the fact that God is loving and forgiving and merciful. And he has sent Jesus Christ to save us. It's so simple. I think what we've done over the last 30, 40, 50 years is we've we've exchanged the real answer that the world needs for a political answer. We have been saved from the wrath of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God has not designed us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. How often do you think of that? How often do you think, I'm saved? And just revel in that. And just glory in that a little bit. And to bring in the problems of this world. Man, I, 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 I voted for this person. This person didn't make it. This person is not going to be president. Many of you, that's where you're at right now. Your bedrock should be the fact that Christ has saved you. The simple verse of John 3.16 should come to your mind. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. That is what the Christian stakes his entire being, his entire life on. We are saved. And I want to ask you this morning. I've been watching a lot of Billy Graham sermons lately. I just think we need to be reminded of the gospel. And I think we as Christians in this room need to be reminded of ourselves. Are we truly believers in Jesus Christ? It brings so much peace to our hearts to remember that we are saved. Saved from the wrath of God. No matter what happens in an election no matter what happens in a country, no matter what happens to us personally, we are saved. Amen? Secondly, we are sojourners. Say, Dave, how do you spell that? Good luck. You can also write in there strangers. I'll give you the spelling of sojourners. S-O-J-O-U-R-N-E-R-S, sojourners. We see this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen. The Bible says that we are aliens, we are strangers, we are sojourners. In 1 Peter 1, verse 17, if you flip there real quick, it says this, 
If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear when? During the time of your stay on earth. During the time of your stay on earth. It's as if we're in a hotel and this is our stay. It's temporary. It's not permanent. And then 1 Peter chapter 2, if you flip over to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, he says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers or sojourners to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. You see, what we need today, what we need right now is to be reminded that we are saved and that we are sojourners. This is not our home. This is not our permanent residence. It hearkens us back to the time of Israel. When you think about Exodus, when you think about the people of Israel coming out of Egypt, the Israelites were sojourners in the wilderness. How long were they there, church? Forty years, wandering around in the wilderness. This is a short glimpse of where we are today. This is our wilderness. This is just a temporary place until we cross over into the promised land. And even though they remained in the wilderness for 40 years, it was not their home. We are not citizens of this world. We are sojourners. Philippians 3, 17 through 20, Brothers and sisters, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you and now tell you, even as I weep, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame, who have their minds, listen now, on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We must make the decision today to take our minds and our thoughts off of earthly things. I believe God wants us to realign our priorities this morning. Many of you are focused on business adventures. Many of you are focused on the the political climate. Many of you are focused on finances or relationships. And those are not necessarily bad things. But as believers in Jesus Christ, we are to focus our hearts on heaven. And on the God of heaven. And we eagerly wait, as Paul tells us, for a Savior. We are anticipating Christ. Just like the song we just sung mentioned. We are waiting. We wait for you. And we beg that he come. We are to hold in the meantime everything in this life with open hands, knowing we have a better inheritance to come. We know that our hope is not here but there. Knowing this, we invest our lives in things that are eternal. This world is not our home because we are sojourners. Amen? We are saved. We are sojourners. Number three, this is going to be a good one. Are you ready? Say amen. amen. You're going to love this. You're, you're just going to, this is going to carry you through. You ready? We are sufferers. That's who we are. We are sufferers. Yes, it's true. We really are sufferers. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have suffered or been distressed by various trials. You see, the theme of the New Testament is joy in the midst of suffering. The theme of the New Testament is love in the midst of suffering. The theme of the New Testament is hope in the midst of what, church? Suffering. Now, nobody in here has ever suffered, right? (laughs) That is the human experience to suffer. We can relate because we have all been through some sort of suffering. Now, there are two sources of suffering. One is sin. Sometimes suffering is self-inflicted. Say that really fast. Suffer and suck (laughs) attach. Sometimes sin is what makes us suffer, right? Right? Even if we don't sin ourselves, what happened in the past affects us now, the fall. Sin causes hurricanes. Sin causes adultery. Sin causes all these horrible things. Death, of course. And so we naturally suffer in this life. And we should not expect anything different but to suffer in this life. If not for only that one man 
sinned. And death came into the world. And death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. But it's not just that, because we have been redeemed. You see, the Christian suffers sometimes when they sin, sometimes for sin, sometimes because of the sin of Adam. But the Christian suffers. Why? Because they are a Christian. This might be a little bit of a punch in the gut this morning. But I assume that you want me to preach the truth. Amen? Amen. James 1, 2. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when, when, everybody say, when, when, you encounter various trials. James says, count it as a joyful thing. Rejoice, be blessed, celebrate to a degree. When you fall, when you fall into various trials, when you encounter suffering, James says rejoice. It should be a joyful thing. Why? Because it's supposed to happen in the life of a believer. 2 Corinthians 4, 8-13 through and 16-18 through says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not despairing. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying around in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who live are constantly being handed over to death because of Jesus. In verse 16 he says, therefore we do not lose heart. Is that a word you need to hear this morning? We do not lose heart. We do not lose heart as believers in Jesus Christ because we know simply believing in Christ and simply following Christ will bring suffering. Suffering in your life is to be expected, believer. You're not odd. God's not picking on you. Amen? This is the human experience because of sin and because you are a Christian. If you live as a Christian, you are going to experience suffering. You're going to experience persecution. And God in His infinite wisdom is going to even allow you to go through very hard circumstances and trials... Separate from the world picking on you, God is going to allow circumstances and situations, going to allow health issues, going to allow financial issues, going to allow the worst possible things to happen to you. Why? Verse 11 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, for for we who live are constantly being handed over to death. Why? Because of Jesus. That's persecution. But we don't lose heart. We're going to go through trials, but we don't lose heart because we know suffering is a part of it. See, all of Scripture, specifically the New Testament, indicates that we should expect suffering. Doesn't that kind of comfort you in a weird way? Isn't that a little bit comforting to know that you're not the only one that's suffering? This is common. Suffering for the Christian is common. Now, everything I just got done saying... How many popular celebrity pastors say this? How often do you hear this? And yet I challenge you to read through one book of the New Testament, just one book of the New Testament, and I challenge you to look for the suffering. It is there in abundance. Dave, I thought you were going to encourage us today. Just hold on. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, We are like the schoolboy who would like to evade certain things. And he would run away from problems and tests. But we thank God that because he has a larger interest in us and knows what is for our good, he puts us through the disciplines of life. He makes us learn the multiplication table. We are made to struggle with the elements of grammar. Many things that are trials to us are essential that one day we may be found without spot or wrinkle. Your suffering is serving a purpose. Your suffering is serving a purpose. The lost in this world endure suffering without comfort of purpose. Do you understand that? The difference between a believer's suffering and unbeliever's suffering is that the unbeliever doesn't understand what the suffering is all about. And God will allow even an unbeliever to suffer so that it will drive them to knowing God. It will drive them to the Savior, to Jesus Christ. And it's the same for the believer. Although we are already saved, 
Christ causes us to be suffering for him so that we will come back to him, so that we will draw close to him. So what in your life right now is making you suffer? Christ wants to use it. Christ wants to use it to bring you to him, to make you more like him, to draw you into him. Amen? Say, I don't like that message. If you don't get that message, you will struggle as a Christian all your life. Never understanding what's happening, never understanding why, and continuing to be bitter towards God and towards the world and towards those around you for the suffering you incur. The believer not only endures suffering, but finds joy in the midst of suffering because his suffering or her suffering holds purpose. 2 Corinthians 4, 17-18, For our momentary light affliction... Is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We need to have a mind shift as a church. We need to have a mind, uh, mind shift as individual believers in Jesus Christ. It has to come off the temporal and on to the eternal, remembering that this is momentary. It's a light affliction comparing to what, it we will, what we will have when we get to eternity. If we suffer with the purposes of God and change into Christ's likeness ourselves and do his will in the midst of suffering and even have joy in the midst of suffering when things don't go our way, if we will do that, the eternal weight of glory just builds and builds and builds. But here's the problem. We're Americans, and so we want it now, and we want it our way. Amen? We're called to so much more. We are sufferers. I dare you to look in the New Testament and find me someone who did not live for Christ who also did not suffer. Our suffering produces an internal transformation. It makes us more like Christ, but it also works an eternal glorification for us. We are sufferers. We are saved. We are, in fact, saved. Amen? That's how we endure the suffering. (laughs) We know we're saved. We know it ends one day. We are sojourners. We know this time on this earth is temporary. And we have a permanent home in heaven. We are sufferers in the midst of this corrupt world. But also, we are sons and daughters of the living God. That's number four. We are sons and daughters. Sons and daughters. That's important to remember in this day and age and in this time and in this tumultuous activity that we have going on. We have viruses. We have elections going crazy. We have all these things up in the air. It's important to remember who we are. We are sons and daughters. Three times in the first chapter of 1 Peter He addresses God as Father. Verse number 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Verse number 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 17, over in chapter, same chapter, if you address as Father, the one who impartially judges. You see, Peter is trying to emphasize something to us in chapter 1, that God is our Father, which makes us his what? Children. You are a son or a daughter of God. 1 Peter 1.14 as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. J, if you are a child of God, and Marty is a child of God, what does that make you? Amen. You are brothers. Linda, if you are a child of God, And Miss Mildred, if you are a child of God, what does that make you? Amen. It's very important at this time in our history, not just as a nation, but as the church, to remember that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. The enemy will use everything and anything to divide the church of God. 1 Peter 1.22 Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Listen to what he says. Fervently or passionately love one another from the heart. 
We are called to love one another with a reckless abandonment. A passion that's deep. A passion that the world looks on in the midst of a crazy election, in the midst of a virus. And they see the love of Christ towards one another in the church. Brother loving brother. Sister loving sister. And they just say, wow, that's something that surpasses anything that I can imagine. See, if you have been born again, you have a new spirit within you. If you have been born again, you have a new bloodline running through you. If you have been born again, you have a new family you belong to. If you have been born again, you are a part of the family of God. Praise God that we are one in Christ through His Spirit and through His blood. And listen, nothing can divide what Christ unites. Don't let the influences of the world divide you as brothers and sisters in Christ. We have the greatest commonality, and that is Christ himself. Ephesians 4, 2 through 6, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. It is evident, again, that our country is divided, but our church must remain united. We are the sons and the daughters of God. Amen? Lastly, number five, we are sanctified. We are sanctified. I'd like you to just put next to that word sanctify a simple definition. Sanctified means to be made holy. To be made holy or to be made pure. You can even put just these two words. Set apart. Set apart. That is what the church and the individual believer needs to be today. We need to be set apart. We need to be set apart so the world can look on and see you as a believer and see the light of Christ in your life, especially at this moment in our history. When does light shine the brightest? When is light needed the most? It's needed in the darkest of nights, amen? And that's the time we're coming to in our country, and it's so important that we are set apart as a people and as individual believers That we focus on being the light, that we focus on being the salt, that we focus on shining the light of Jesus Christ to those in darkness. We are sanctified. Now we've talked about this aspect before and all this has been reviewed. But I feel, I just want to be honest with you this morning. I feel that God has really spoken to me this week specifically in a very cerebral way. That I was trying to get my mind around something for the longest time and I've been asking God this question over and over and over and I'll tell you what that question was here in a moment but we've discussed these points that we're going to talk about here in a moment under under sanctification and what that is But, but I want you to understand that there's hope for today it's not just a distant hope Because the question that I keep asking, have have been asking myself over and over is, Lord, I know I have a hope somewhere in glory. I know I have a hope later. I know I have streets of gold. I know I have a home in heaven. I know I'm secure. I know I have an inheritance. I know I have a house. I know I have all these things. But, Lord, I need hope now. Amen? I need something real now. And and what is the answer, Lord? And, And as I dug into the word of God, The Lord brought some things to my mind and one main thing which I'll share with you here in a moment. But we need to understand what sanctification is first. There are different aspects to sanctification for the believer. Remember, sanctification is being made holy or to be made pure, to be set apart. And the first aspect of sanctification is positional sanctification. You'll want to write that down. Positional sanctification. This is past. This is something that happened in your past. This is what we talk about when when you got saved, that you were sanctified, you were automatically made holy by God. Peter talks about that in chapter 2, flip there with me, chapter 2, verse number 9. He's talking about the church as a collective group, but it also applies individually to believers. But you are a chosen race, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What is Peter saying? He's referencing Old Testament Israel. He's talking about how the children of Israel were the chosen people. How they were sanctified in the sense that they were set apart from the other nations. Now listen, as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, if you've trusted in him for salvation, guess what's happened to you? You've been grafted in to that. Have you ever done any grafting? Anybody ever craft, grafted any plants? I, I, I just think that's amazing, number one. That you can cut a plant and then cut another stem of a separate plant completely and place it on there and eventually it will begin to grow into that plant. That's what's happened for you and me as believers in Jesus Christ. We have been grafted into the family of God. We have been grafted in by Christ, by the blood of Christ, by the cross of Christ. We have been placed into Christ and therefore we are now a part of the family of God, the children of God. But it's not just that. When you were sanctified, that moment that you believed, what happened? You changed positions. You changed teams. Amen? You went from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Ephesians 2, 5-6 through 6 says it this way. Even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, Christ made us alive together. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's this idea of kingship. And that Christ brought you along and placed you alongside of him. On equal level with you. We are now sons and daughters. Heirs with Christ. Brothers and sisters with Christ. And we are positionally. When Christ sees you, you know what he sees? He sees himself. He sees holiness. He sees righteousness. When God the Father looks down and looks at you. If you are in Jesus Christ. He sees the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That should elicit an amen. <laughs> That's the most important, that is the most important sanctification that you need. That one time sanctification of Christ died for me, I trust in him, and now because of Christ's righteousness, God sees me as righteous. John MacArthur said that God looked down on the cross and saw Christ as you so that now he could look at you and see Christ. He flipped the script, Christ took on our sin, Christ looked at us and, and became what we needed so that we could be positionally saved, positionally sanctified. But then you think about the future. The future of sanctification, which is perfect sanctification. That's the second thing you should write down. We have positional sanctification. At one point in the past you believed and God made you perfectly in line with him, made you sinless, made you righteous because of Christ. That happened at one moment and one time in the past. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, God changed your heart. God changed your soul. He made you a new creation in Christ. Amen? But there is a future, a perfect sanctification to come. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, listen to what he says. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for what? For a salvation ready to be revealed when? In the last time. There is a glorification coming for you, Christian. No more sin, no more death, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears, no more anything like that. There is a sanctification coming for you that is perfect. One day we will be saved from the presence of sin. Man, I look forward to that day. John 3, 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He, speaking of Christ, appears, listen to this, listen, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. So we have a positional sanctification, which is in the past. We have a perfect sanctification, which is in the future. But what haven't I talked about? We are being sanctified right now. As we live here in this world, there is progressive sanctification. There is Positional sanctification, which is in the past. We have perfect sanctification, which will be in the future. But right now, we experience progressive sanctification. This is the present sanctification that Christ is doing in us. Peter talks about this in chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. This is what he calls us to. Are you listening? Say amen. 
He says in verse number 15 of chapter 1, But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. That's what we're talking about when we talk about sanctification. Holiness, being separate, being pure. And there is a progressive sanctification that should be happening in your heart and in your life, believer. That the suffering of this life and the suffering and the disappointments and the trials that you're facing right now should be forming you and molding you more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. And the question is, are you letting it? Or are you just looking at the trials and the sufferings and the difficulties as just those things? Things to be avoided. Tests and math problems to not go through. I don't want to do that. That's not fun. That's not That's not good for me. That's not joyful. That's painful. And Christ would say, no, you need to embrace those things and let those things wash over you and wash away the sin and wash away the habits and wash away the dirt in your life to reveal Christ in you. Amen? It's progressive sanctification. It's a process by which we are presently being saved from the practice and power of sin. Colossians 3.18, but we all with unveiled faces, looking as in a mirror at the glory of of the Lord, as we look at Christ himself, are being transformed into the same image. What same image? The image of Christ. As we look at Christ, we're being changed into the image of Christ. And then he says this phrase, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. That's why Jesus says in John 17, 17, he calls on the Father to sanctify believers in the truth. What is the truth? Your word is truth. You can't be being sanctified, you can't be progressively being made holy right now if you're not in the truth, because only the truth sanctifies. And if you're down and if you're discouraged this morning, if life's trials and sufferings has you there, you need to pick up the truth, and you need to wash yourself in the truth, and you need to remember who God says you are in the truth, and grow through those trials and those sufferings. I beg you, Christian, not to stay where you are. So back to my original question at the beginning of this point. I know I have hope there. I know I have a hope in heaven. The streets of gold. I know I have those things. I have all the blessings of the inheritance of Christ. I have perfection. I have the removal of sin. I have an inheritance. I have a home. I have, and we just go on and on and on and on and on and list all the things we have. But what about now? How do I have hope, joy, peace, and even love right now? Let me ask you this. Now, don't get spiritual on me for one moment, okay? Just think carnally. I want you to think earthly. I want you to think like you're not a Christian. What do we think as, as people, as human beings, what do we think brings us joy, peace, love, and hope right now? Material possessions, something. What else? Family, success, career. What else? A relationship. When I was young, it was a certain toy, right? How, can, how many of you can remember? You think back to that Christmas where you, man, I hope I get that. I hope I get that. I hope I get that. And you thought when you got that thing, then you'd have joy forever, right? How naive we were. As we grew, it just simply it shifted, right? From that toy to now if I just meet that someone, they can fill that hole in my heart. If I just meet that perfect spouse, then I'll be happy forever. If I can just have this career, if I can just have this certain amount of money, if I can just have, we fill in the blanks. And that's where we seek peace and joy and love. But we discovered that though they may bring temporary satisfaction, they are imperfect and unlasting. And yet we still pursue those things as believers, don't we? Not all of those things are bad things. From an earthly perspective, when have you, again, from a carnal perspective, when have you had the most joy, peace, love, and satisfaction in your life? What has brought that to you? Has it been a thing? Has it been a vehicle? Has it been a house? Has it been food? Has it been money? What has brought you true joy? 
If I can answer for you, I think you would say this. It's some type of relationship. Right? If we're honest, it's some type of relationship. Maybe it's a child that you have. Maybe it's a grandchild. Maybe it is a spouse, a husband or a wife. Maybe it's a friendship that you hold very, very dear. Listen, that is not an accident. You see, that is hinting at something for you and me. You see, how do we have hope? How do we have peace? How do we have love? How do we have joy right now? I want you to imagine something for a moment. Imagine that your spouse or imagine that that person that you love in this life, that friendship or that son or that daughter or that grandchild, imagine that they are perfect. Amen? Wouldn't that be great? All you men, don't say amen right now. Now imagine yourself to be perfect. And let's just take that, that illustration of the marriage relationship, the husband being perfect and the wife being perfect. Do you think that would bring joy, peace, love, and hope? Amen? It will. It would. But it can never be found in the marriage of a husband and wife in human terms. Where we find hope right now is in the perfect man, Jesus Christ. And listen, here's the beautiful part. As we see Christ in all his perfection, and as we begin allow allowing the sufferings of this world to make us more like Jesus, to make us more, listen, perfect. We come closer and closer to joy and peace and love and hope. The answer for where do I have hope right now, where do I find peace, where do I find love, where do I find all these things I'm craving is in the person of Jesus Christ. If I may be so bold and to skip ahead in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, I want you to turn there and look at it with me. I'm going to cheat a little bit. I know we haven't gotten to 1 Peter chapter 3 yet as we've gone through this sermon series, but I want you to notice something. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Peter says this. He says, well, let's back up verse 14. But even if you should suffer, here's our word again, for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. Verse 15, but what? But sanctify or set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account. Here it is. For the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. All throughout the New Testament, we see that our hope is actually Christ himself. Yes, we have a future hope and we look to that. But listen, the way that we have hope right now is in a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. Now I want you to just notice one more thing as we're about to close. I want you to see the goodness of God in all of this. What did I do today? It wasn't anything super deep. But we reviewed 1 Peter, what we've been going through for almost 20 weeks. You think God isn't sovereign? (laughs) You think God isn't in control? (laughs) Look at what he's spoken to us through his word. He's given us peace and hope and comfort and joy and love through his word. And he's begging us and he's calling us to come and to be with him and to know him more. What an amazing thing that Christ would be so kind and so gracious that at this moment, whatever suffering, whatever distress, whatever trial you're going through, whatever discouragement, whatever despair, whatever depression you're going through, Christ is funneling you and and pushing you and trying everything to just get you to look to him, to press into him. That's the application this morning. To press into Christ, to press into Jesus, to draw into his presence, to come close to him. Because the temptation is is that when suffering happens, when trial happens, when things don't go the way we think they should go, what we do is we run away from Christ. And Christ says that's the exact opposite of what I've intended this suffering for you. I've intended it to push you to me. Press into Christ. Press into Christ.